different country, I had a religious visa, I couldn't work, and the only thing that I could somehow legally do was to help somebody sell cars. So I met this guy and I was helping him you know, sell cars. He was giving me a commission. Um, I didn't know that this guy was actually bringing them illegally into the country. So he was evading taxes and uh, he was doing something else that you know, was criminal. So um, in, uh, in a turn of events, I ended up in, you know, with these people that were doing this kind of thing. So I started praying to God for you know, deliverance from this problem. And uh, one uh, afternoon, I don't know if you guys remember this, probably not, you were, too, you were too young for that. Tony was probably three years old or something like that, and Abby was maybe one, so you don't remember, I'm sorry, yeah. But you know, one afternoon when we were, uh, when we were um, eating together as a family, somebody knocked on the door. And so I went, I went open the door, and I see these six guys that are right in front of my door. They just said, are you, you know, Tony Campos? I said, yes. And then I heard the words, you are under arrest for tax evasion and uh, car theft. And I was, before I could say anything, I said like, and they're like, we're gonna have to take you. And you know, just give me a moment. And I turned to grab something. And when I turned, they, they all grabbed me. They probably thought I was gonna run away. They handcuffed me, took me outside. Um, and put me in the back of a pickup truck and took me to the little town, you know, the little town's jail where um, we, we lived in a little town at the moment. And um, they took me there. And, and um, on the way there, I'm, I'm asking, you know, God, what's going on here? I'm your favorite missionary. I know that. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've done all this, all this. I'm trying to do all these things. And I'm following your steps. And I left my country to come to this place, I've gone through so much, and I'm just doing this to support my family. But but now, you know, what what's happening here? And so I thought maybe God is mad at me because I might have done something wrong. I don't know. You know, when you're in a in a hard situation, you really don't think straight. You know, you you kind of like you want to think straight, but it's really difficult to keep you calm and to um and, and to think the right thing. So I'm thinking maybe maybe God is upset with me because I was upset uh, upset with myself. Well, I was a dummy. This guy took advantage of me and, and he was doing something criminal. I didn't even realize, right? Uh, then then I, I started thinking, maybe, maybe I didn't pray enough about this situation. What if I had prayed more? What if I went on fasting and, um, and God would have listened to my prayer? And now, um, later on I thought about maybe, maybe I did something. I really did something wrong without even knowing. And now this is the consequence. I'm paying for my sins. So I'm going to have to, you know, to pay for this. Um, and I don't know if you've ever, I, don't, I hope you've never been in a situation like this. <laughs> but if you've ever been in a, in a similar situation, um, in fact, I don't think there is anyone in here or anywhere in the world, world for that matter, that hasn't gone through a situation where, where you think, how did I get myself into this? You've ever been there? Like, what am I doing here now? You know, it could be, it could be a, a job. It could be a relationship. It could be hanging out with the certain kind of people. You go like, how in the world did I end up here? And the, um, the, then we start asking, you know, uh, either God or ourselves for a solution. How am I going to get out of this? What am I going to do? And for us Christians, you know, any, or a, any religious person, Going to God in a situation like this is kind of like what we do. You know, we go to God and said, God, can you help me here? And we would hope that God will immediately say, like, of course, you're my favorite child. You know, David, I'm going to get you out of this thing like right away. But, you know, and I know that that doesn't usually happen. It seems like sometimes God will not answer the prayer or he will not resolve the situation in the way that we wanted to. And many times we wonder why, why it doesn't seem like God actually delivers us from our trials. Mm-hmm. Have you ever wondered that? Or is it just me? No. No, I'm sure that you've went through something that you, that you thought about like, why? Why did this happen? Why did you have to go through this? And more importantly, why nobody, including God, seemed to be able to help me? So today we're going to look at a story that is a well-known story in the Bible. Because I, I want to challenge that assumption that God doesn't deliver us. And I want to um, open up the perspective to 
to something that is probably much bigger than just getting out of your, uh, of your situation or getting out of your problem or getting out of jail or getting out of whatever. Just, just uh, opening up to the idea that what if, what if when the Bible talks about God's deliverance is much more uh, beautiful and greater than you and I could ever imagine? And what if it has a purpose greater than even our own situation? So the, the, in the Bible, you find Daniel. It's the book of Daniel, the prophet, chapter 6. And uh, even if you're not a person that studies the Bible, you know this one. Because it's that story where Daniel, the prophet, is thrown into the, the, the lion's den. Uh, it's, it's a story where, um, you know, uh, the king, uh, Darius, which is now the third king, that Daniel is serving. So just to give you a little context, I know that Pastor Carlos has given you context on this, but Daniel is an exile from Jerusalem, from the Jewish people. He has been taken into Babylon as an exile. While he's there, he's trained uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as a person that is going to work for the, for the government, for the kingdom. And he works for the first king that I can't say his name for the life of me. Um, <laughs> And then he works for his uh, grandson many years later. And, and then after they are defeated by the Persians, because the Persians invaded Babylon on the 500 something. Uh, the details are not important. Anyways, uh, they, they invaded. And then this new king, um, Darius, is his name? Darius? Yeah, Darius. Um, he's now the new king. And Daniel, which is about now like 80 years old, um, gets called to serve with this king. And um, Daniel is a faithful man. He's been serving kings and he's been serving God faithfully. And he is, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the text, and you, maybe you can read it also later in, in your, you know, in your um, house at your own pace. But it says that the king appointed like, like 120 uh, people to rule over the kingdom and then three governors. So it's like, like 120 managers and then three super managers that are going to supervise everything. And then they're going to report to the king. And one of the three that he, he appointed, one of them is Daniel. And, uh, and the king really likes this guy because even though he's old, he has already served all these other kings. But he's also really faithful. And it says that there is in him a, 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 a superior spirit. Right? This is the word that the Bible uses. So. So, so it, it, it seems like, like the king has seen something in Daniel that he really likes. He's, you know, part of it is his work ethic, his wisdom, his, his integrity, all these things. So, so he is like climbing up again this, this ladder that he's not interested in climbing. But over and over again, he ends up being on the top of all these other people, right? And the other 122 guys start getting envious about him. And they say, you know what? We're going to bring him down. And, uh, and we need to find something in which we can accuse him before the king so, he, so we can get rid of him. There's a little problem. They couldn't find anything in Daniel that will uh, be grounds for accusing him before the king. They, they found one thing that is very obvious in the life of Daniel. And that is that he is a faithful man to his God, which is Yahweh, right? And they said, you know what? We're not going to be able to find anything on this guy. The only thing that we're going to find is uh, anything that is related to his God. So they came up with a plan. They went to the king. They, uh, they talked to him behind Daniel's back. And they said, king, oh king, oh beautiful king, oh great and gracious king. We have something to tell you about your greatness. And king is like all pumped up. And he's like, what is it? And say, why don't you make a, an, uh, um, uh, an ordinance from your kingdom that nobody is allowed to pray to any other gods other than your gods? And king is like, that sounds like very reasonable. I would like everybody to pray to my, my, my gods. And so he makes the, the, he signs the, not signs it, but you know, he, he writes the ordinance and he seals it with a seal and then he send out to everybody. And they said, like, we got Daniel. And indeed they did. Because once he knew about it, and he went to pray to Yahweh, they arrested him, took him to the king and said, there is one man that has broken your law already, and it's this guy. 
The punishment for that is to be thrown into the lion's den, right? And so that's that's basically like like the background of the of the story and how these things are 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 are, are, happen, are happening to to him. And I, you know, when you think about this, you immediately can draw some conclusions about uh, some lessons that you can learn that are kind of universal in life. I'm going to give you a couple of them. Hopefully, we can go with this. Um, so the first one is that. Whether you're a Christian or not, right? Um, but there's always going to be people that are envious of your success. I'm not talking about financial success, or, but that in, that's, that's included. But I'm talking about the kind of success that Daniel had. If you look at verse 3, the success that he had wasn't, not, wasn't only that he was a good administrator, or he had wisdom, or the, it, the, the Bible actually says that there was a, a superior spirit in him. That meant that he's a man of character, of integrity. He's a faithful man. He serves his God. He serves the people well. He is respectful. He's, 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 a, well, you know, he's, a, he's a good guy. And he's not interested in, in these positions. He's not interested in power. He's interested in being faithful to God. And that success, which the Bible calls faithfulness... Uh, gets people trick, uh, triggered sometimes. And they're going to be like, I really don't like this guy, you know? Uh, when he didn't go to church, he was a much better friend. Oh, he's going to church, man. Like, I really don't like him because he doesn't like to do the things we used to do before. You know, this or that or whatever. And they start looking at your life because now they look at you through the lenses of, why is this person now changing all of a sudden? So that's one thing. The second thing, is that if you keep doing that and you keep developing, developing your faithfulness to God, um, that is gonna, that's going to make that some people wrongly accuse you of who you are, mm-hmm. right? And I'm just telling you this because some of, you know, most of you are young believers. Some of you are just exploring the faith. And you need to know from, from the moment that you start doing this, you need to know this. The moment that you decide to be faithful to God, you're going to make some enemies, right? There are some people that are going to be a little upset that now you are being faithful to God because, because faithfulness to God is always going to create some enemies for you. You may be overlooked for a job position because you can't work on Sundays because you like to go to church. Right. You're gonna get you're gonna get some friend some friends saying something bad about you because they just don't like that now you're a Christian and you know you're not as fun as you used to be. You can get some family members that are gonna be like, What are you talking about? We know we've known you since you were a baby, and now you're telling us about God. Like, cut it off, man. Like, you don't have a right to tell us about God. You're gonna get all this. Because faithfulness to God always means unfaithfulness to the non-gods. So you can always find yourself in this position, right? And number three, just like in the case of Daniel, in case you didn't know, (laughs) but I'm sure you do, you have an enemy of your soul, right? The Bible calls him the accuser. Uh, we, We call him the devil. We call him Satan. Uh, he's got many names in the Bible, but, but one thing is, 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 is it's true. In Scripture, there is this spiritual being that opposes the, the, you know, the, the life of God in you and wants to um, seduce you, to deceive you, to, um, to persuade you from now following this. And one of the things that you will find as you grow in your faith is that the devil, may the Lord rebuke him, is going to take advantage of other people's weakness and malice to, um, to put them against you. Right? How, uh, this sounds like, Tony, are you getting a little paranoid here? Like, is the devil really after me? Like, not, not necessarily that he is after you, but the system that he has devised in the world is designed for you to fall into these traps. And so people sometimes are going to, the, the enemy is going to take advantage of people 
their ignorance, their malice, and, and they're going to turn them against you. Just like these people came with the king who loved Daniel deeply and they deceived him and then he ended up hurting his friend. And sometimes you're going to find people that are not want to be your friends anymore or that family members that are going to, you know, like abandon you even because you're following the ways of God. And it, it, it's, many times these people don't know, so it's not a fight like with against them. The, the Bible is really specific. The Apostle Paul says, we do not wrestle against people. Flesh and blood, he says. We wrestle against the, against the principalities and the powers. So there is this darkness that is fighting against you, right? Jesus makes it very clear when he's on the cross. Remember what the first words that he says? He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. But the devil has taken advantage of their ignorance to hurt you. And I'm not trying to like scare you off so you can, oh, I'm going to be closer to God because the devil left. No, 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 it's, it's not that. I'm just telling you the reality of the Christian life is like, you follow Christ, there's going to be opposition. You need to know that from the very beginning. Because if you, if you come in saying like, oh yeah, I love Jesus, I want to follow him. And then you, you find the opposition, you're like, ah, no, this is not for me. Like nobody told me that people are going to hate on me. Nobody told me that, you know, I have to commit to anything. No. You already know this, right? So there's going to be these moments in life when you feel accused and harassed by people or circumstances or even the enemy. There's going to be these times when somebody's going to betray you. Somebody's going to, to, to talk bad about you. Sometimes when your best friends are going to turn against you. You need to know that that is, that is true. And many of these times... You are going to wonder if it's worth remaining in the faith. When Daniel receives the, you know, the ordinance of the king that he's going to be thrown into the lion's den. Do you think that he was like, oh, cool. God is going to save me. It's okay. He didn't know that. Right? I mean... Nobody comes to you like immediately and say like, hey, you know what? Guess what? You're going to be thrown into the lions. You're ready for this? No, I'm not ready. I really don't want to do this. And, and maybe at that time, maybe you too, at that time, you need to think about if your faith is worth the trials. If faith in Jesus is really worth the trials. And of course, Daniel is a, an exceptional person, but he's still a man that doesn't know what's going to happen, right? But I want you to look at what he did when he received the, the ordinance from the king. It's in verse 10 and 11. And he, the, the beauty about how he responds is like, and I, I wouldn't respond like this, like he did, you know. I would probably run away <laughs> if I could. Like once I know they're after me, like, okay, bye. I don't know if I'll stay for, to see the end of this. But Daniel, when he heard, right, that the king is going to throw him into the lion's den. You know what he does? Verse 10, 11. He said, he goes to his house. Like if the police is going after me, I'm not going to my house. I'm going to go hide somewhere else. He goes to his house. And if I know they're going to accuse me of something, I'm going to avoid doing the thing they're going to accuse me for. Now, Daniel, he opens up the windows and he prays. Not one time, not two times, three times a day, turning towards Jerusalem, praying to God. What you do in the critical moments of your life tells you exactly who you are and how much you trust God. The things that you do when, th when, when circumstances are out of control, when things don't go well in your life, the, the things that you reach to tells you exactly who you're trusting. Yeah, the first thing you do when you got problems, like let me look at my bank account and see if I can get rid of this problem. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. You know, you got to be prepared and all that. But if your first instinct is like, hey man, I got to tell a couple of lies to fix the other couple of lies that I've already said. Because if I don't, I'm going to get in more trouble or I got to pay the, whatever you think you do. But, but when you see Daniel, and I, I'm not saying I do these things, you know, I, I, many times I do the opposite. But the lesson is the same. What you do when nobody's watching or when somebody's watching defines your character. And so what it indicates, 
What indicates about him, it's what we said before, that Daniel has tasted and see the goodness of God. Man, just like you taste the bread and the wine, and you, you wish that it will taste a little better, yeah? but it's just a foretaste of what is coming. You know, one day the table is going to be set, and God is going to be right there, and the real food and the real drink, which is the Lord Jesus, is going to be there for you forever. But now you have foretasted the goodness of God. And in 80 years, 80 years of his life, Daniel has tasted and seen the goodness of God. You know what he knows? He knows God can deliver. But he doesn't know when. And he knows that God can change the circumstances. But he doesn't know how. And he knows that God is able to show himself in the midst of all this trial. But he doesn't know when and where and how. And even if he knew. God is, going about, God is about to surprise him with how he's going to show up. See, we all wish that we will be spared from this moment. We all wish that this will never happen. And if it happened, we all want God to show up. Just like what happened to Daniel when he gets thrown down into the, the lion's den. You know what happened? It says that the angel of the Lord shut the mouth of the lions. And, and this happened in real life. But it has happened also in, in a spiritual sense too. You know, like somebody, how many times God has delivered you from, from a lion that was about to eat you up. And, and it didn't happen. <laughs> like I should have died in that accident, but I didn't. How did God deliver me from that? How did God deliver me from a relationship that I thought it was going to be for, for me forever? And, and, and now God has spared me from this, even if it was painful. Right? He doesn't know that yet. And we all wish that these things were, 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 had a, a happy ending all the time. But, but they don't. You know how we know that they don't? Well, look at the Son of Man on the cross. If God was supposed to deliver all of us from our trials, He would have never hung on the cross. But that is the first indication that God's deliverance is much more greater than anything that you can imagine. Because the Son of Man hanging on the cross seems like a defeat, seems like a bad plan, seems like God is not listening, yet at the end is deliverance for all humanity. We have the testimony of the people throughout the church. And I can tell you a couple of stories when, I, when God has come through in a, in a particular way without, but, but first having to go through some suffering. I was, I was thinking about the story of Perpetua. Have you, you guys never heard of her? Yeah, you've heard of Perpetua? And um, what's her, the, her friend's name? Fel, Felicitas. I don't know how to say it in English, but this is two, this is two, two young mothers. Um, Perpetua had a baby uh, and... Um, and Felicitas uh, was pregnant, eight one months pregnant. They both were teachers in the church, uh, somewhere around the year 200, 203. And when, when they were teaching uh, the people, the catechism to become believers, to, become, to be baptized, they were arrested by the authorities for being Christians. And uh, they were taken to jail. Perpetua was able to take his baby, though eventually it was taken away from her. And Felicitas was pregnant eight months, and their friends were with them. And uh, uh, Perpetua was from a rich family, so dad had a way to get into the, you know, into the, the, the jail system and all that. And he went to see her and said, hey, just, just tell them you don't believe in Jesus anymore. Like, like you, really don't, you really believe, but just tell them you don't so they can spare you. Think about your baby. Think about me. Think about your mother. And then Perpetua answered him and he said, Dad, what is it that you see over there? And, and he turned and said, it's a jar for water. And he said, well, it, it's a jar. And, he, and, and Perpetua said, can you call that anything else than a jar? And, and he said, no, what are you talking about? It's a jar. What does it have to do with all this? She said, I am a Christian. There's no other name for me other than a follower of Christ. Then her friend who was a slave, Felicitas, she was eight months pregnant and they spared her life. Because according to Roman law, she cannot be um, executed while being pregnant. Right? 
it were me, I wouldn't be like, oh, thank goodness that I was pregnant because... But three days before the execution, she gathered the saints and said, pray that I will deliver this baby so that I can be with you and give my life for Jesus. And a few hours later after praying, she delivered a baby who was given to a Christian mother to be raised. And three days later, they all went into the arena where they faced the wild beast was a lion, I mean a bear, a wild boar, and a leopard. And God closed, shut the mouth of the lion so they wouldn't eat up Daniel. But he didn't do that with Perpetua and Felicitas and their friends. They got chewed up by the bear and the, the beasts. And then they gave their lives, right? And God, God did not answer that. Maybe they didn't have enough faith. Or maybe the emperor was much more powerful than Darius the king. Or, or, maybe, or maybe they did something wrong they deserved it, right? None of that. None of that. God delivered them in a different way. God delivered them in a way that they could understand at the moment. Because... God's deliverance is much more greater than anything that you can imagine. And I understand that most of us don't want to go through this and say like, Oh yeah, God has big plans for my life. Therefore, you know, bring it on. Give me the trials. None of us are like that. Like we, we don't like to go through those things, you know, ever. So I'm not expecting anybody to say when they're going through something similar or some trouble. I'm not expecting anybody to say something like, oh, yeah, 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 it's good because God has a plan for me. I don't do that. You don't do that. Nobody does that. But, but I hope you don't have any doubts about this. Whatever it is that you're going through, you will go through in your life. God will be with you. Make no mistake about it. No mistake about it. God is greater than Anything you are facing today in your life and anything you will ever face in your life. God is greater than anything and He will see His purposes fulfilled in your life one way or another. Mm. So let me end with this. When I was in that little cell in the jail, it was so tiny that I could see from here it was like from here to the end of this building, I could see the, the counter where the, you know, the chief of police is. And one thing that I immediately noticed, I don't know how, my skinny wife got from, you know, four miles away. They took me in a, in a pickup truck. But by the time they put me in the cell, and I looked, I see Fabiola over there. <laughs> Looking with that, you know, like that, in, that, that face that you, she's worried, she's crying, all these things. But, but when I look at her, it's like, oh. Just here to encourage me as well. God, God is here. The second thing I saw, I saw this man that I just recently met. His name was Marcel. Marcel was a Lebanese, Belizean guy who was very wealthy. And a few months ago, ago he had become a Christian. Uh, he's the first guy in his family that had become a Christian. And, and we have become friends uh, because we knew, we, I knew his pastor. And uh, Marcel... Um, was not only wealthy, but his family were involved in politics in the government in Belize. And so his um, cousin was the mayor of the city. So I could hear what's happening when Marcel came and picked up his phone and he said, hey, cousin, I have a situation here. Um, they have a guy there. He's the wrong guy. He's a pastor. I know him. Um, and so he's, he tell the, the guy, the police, the chief of police, he's like, you need to let him go. He's like, no, I'm sorry, I can't. There's something pending with him. He gives him the phone. And all I could hear is like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Give him back the phone. And I know I'm out to deliverance. And that's beautiful. But the third thing I saw, more importantly, I was put in a jail with a, with a young man. The night before, he has murdered someone. And I'm there, afraid, because this guy, he looks crazy. And he's going to jail for real. Right? For real. And I'm there with him. And in the few hours that I was there with them, with him, I had the opportunity in trembling and fear to tell him about the love of Jesus. 
Now one day I'm going to make it to heaven. Just like you. And the first thing I'm going to ask God is like, is there a man here who murdered a young man <laughs> 20 years ago that I preached the gospel to him? I want to know if he believed. And if he did, I want to give him the greatest hug. Now you may think these trials that you go through are so annoying and so difficult and so this and so that. And just let me tell you something to encourage you today. If you could only see what God is going to do through them. You'll be so encouraged in your faith. Just by knowing that nothing that you will ever encounter in your life. Will be a match for the God that you call your father. Nothing in this life. And he will turn things around for you. And he will make things different for you. And sometimes he will let you go through the problems and through the lions and be chewed up by the lions. Yet he's going to turn things around because there's nothing that can stop his plans in your life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And the last thing I want to say. The one deliverance that you can be assured of that God has already accomplished and nobody can take this away is the one that nothing, nobody could have ever taken care of. He delivered us from the, condemna the condemnation of sin and death. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, the Son of God died for the sins of the world. And if you haven't taken care of that problem yet, listen to me well. If you haven't taken care of the problem of sin and death in your life, it doesn't matter how many problems you resolve in your life, doesn't matter if you have your life planned already, if you already took care of your business, if you finished your education, if you have a car, if you're buying a house, if you have a girlfriend, if you don't have a girlfriend. It doesn't matter. If you haven't resolved the issue of your eternal life, you have resolved nothing yeah. in your life. Today, you can walk out of here saying, God took care of that. He shut the mouth of the big liar lion who is the devil never again will I belong to that den would you stand and pray with me